Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. We're running like 212 mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, whoa, whoa. And Ward's like, well, you know how Ward is. He's just laid back. He's like, well, it drives pretty good. You know? And my tendon broke in my thumb and went up in my arm. So I get through that stop, and then I tape my hand to the gun to finish. I think we had three more stops, got through the day. And then I drove the hauler home, too. And they're up there just laughing and having a good old time, and that just hit me wrong. And I crutches down, and I go after him, right? And I'm going to beat his ass. I'm mad. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Now, you're from Rockford, Illinois. Is that correct? Yeah, I grew up in Texas uh, till I graduated high school and then went back up to home to Rockford where my father had originally had a truck repair business in Chicago. And uh, Now, you were born in Rockford. When- no, I was actually born at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, my dad was in the military at really? the time. Yeah, and then he... He'd served about 14 years, and they were getting ready to send him. I was born in 65, so Vietnam was kicking off, and they were going to send him to Nam, and he didn't re-up his contract. So he decided to move to Chicago and start a truck repair business. He was into maintenance in the Army. And so I grew up in a suburb of Chicago to the sixth grade, and then he sold his business in Chicago, and we moved to Beaumont, Texas. And, And he built a new truck repair business down there, and then I stayed in you can imagine I was pretty tired of being around the truck repair business because you were in the Hilton Army <laughs> with my father, you know. So we, uh, you know, I learned a lot about diesel trucks and mechanics from my father. I owe him everything. His work ethic was what probably saved me a lot of times because of me being probably too aggressive. But if you have that work ethic, that kind of overrides that in this business, you know. In racing, you had to have that work ethic. So. I decided I was done with that. I moved back to Rockford. That's where I met my wife. And um, I started racing at Rockford Speedway, just helping out on late models. And uh, a guy named Vince Miller, who's he, he was instrumental in helping me get going. His father owned a big quarter horse ranch, and he was the brewmaster for Kikaman Soy Sauce, which is... Really? Yeah. So he had, had some money, you know, and we raced Artgo. Back then, Artgo was... Man, it was the moon to me because it was Joe Shear Sr. and Dick Trickle and Butch Miller and Rich Bickle and Al Schill and Conrad Morgan and all these great racers. And we would run Slinger on Sunday nights with that car, and then we'd go to the Arco specials. We didn't go to all of them because it was pretty pricey to go to them, but we'd go to most of the ones. We'd run Ileana and Slinger, Rockford, the Dells, you know, Lacrosse. That's it. That's where I came up with, and so. That's how I knew Joe Shears Jr. really well and Chad Knauss. And so we all came up together at the same time. And uh, Chad's dad was unbelievably great race car driver, John Knauss. He raced at Rockford Speedway. He was four-time track champion there. He'd raced in ASA. He'd actually gotten hurt in an ASA car pretty bad and had stopped racing for a while and then went back racing weekly at Rockford. And Joe Sr. had Joe Jr. a car, and he raced at Rockford. And when Joe showed up with his senior showed up with his car, you were running for second. It was the nicest race car you ever saw. And I got to know Wayne Lensing and all the guys at Left Hander, and I probably bugged them guys more than they'd ever want to know trying to learn how to set this car up. And and uh, we had a blast doing that for a long time, you know. And I really wanted to go racing full time, you know. The the show. Hidden Heroes was on, you know, on TNN, and we, you'd get to see a race here and there. It wasn't like that; it was on every week like it is now. But I saw that there was an opportunity maybe to go make a living doing this, and my wife wasn't real big on it because I was a diesel mechanic up there at a Pete dealership. And luckily, I had a great general manager, and he knew what I was trying to do. So I worked flat rate, and as long as I booked forty, he didn't care how many days I worked. So I'd work like three twelves Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday book 40 and then i'd go racing from then on because you know we'd run wednesday night at the dells saturday night at rockford sunday at slinger and you know we we raced a lot you you had it bad (laughs) yeah well it was the only way you were going to make it right because there was a lot of people you know trying to go racing and yeah i got a chance to work on tom carlson's car some the, the steve carlson's brother um we decided to 
buy a Dylan chassis because they were kind of the hot lick at the time. So we went down to one of his seminars. I can't remember. It might have been the winter of 88 or so. And I met Ray, and Tony Raines was his house driver. And he welded chassis up on the service plate during the week, and they ran an All-American Challenge car. And so I talked him into letting me go to some All-American Challenge races with him. And so I'd drive all the way to South Bend, get on his Seneca 2, and we'd fly down to the south. Yeah. And Tony was kind of billed as the northern guy, right? And so we'd go down. We ran really good all the time. Had a blast. We ended up buying that car and racing it up in Artgo some. And that got me some, you know, some people to, to, to know. And actually, the first racing job I ever got, I went to work for Ernie Roselli in Pennsylvania. And that's who Tony Range drove ASA for for a year or two. And I got over there, and Ernie had a trucking company. And he... I love Ernie to death, but I ended up working on the trucks a lot more than the race cars, and that really wasn't the deal, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So Bob Leitzinger was based out of uh, State College, Pennsylvania, and they had a two-car factory Nissan GTU team. So that's Grand Touring Under in IMSA. And so at the time, IMSA was GTP, GTP Light, GTO, and GTU Light, or GTU, which was Grand Touring Under 3 Liters. So I went to work for them for a while, and I, it was like oil and water. I was a short track guy, and they were all, you know, wine and cheese guys, and didn't work out very good. And there was a company in Florida called Chris Clark Racing, and they were running a GTP light car with a, a kid named David Tennyson with Denon Audio Video on the car, and they needed a gearbox guy, and it paid really good. And they were kind of putting the word out in the paddock. So we loaded up the kids again and moved to Florida, and went down there and I raced for them for a year and worked on their car for a year. Well, David, at, right at the end of the year, he made the decision to go drive for the Spice Factory, which is the chassis we ran at GTP, the full level GTP. We were running lights with a Ferrari engine. So we were all out of work. I'm in Florida, no work, no hope. So I start making some calls and there, you know, there wasn't texting and cell phones and all that back then. So it was hard to get a hold of people. And I finally got a hold of Joe Shear Jr. and he'd moved down and he was working at Stanley Smith's and they were running, they had a 18 or 19 race deal with interstate batteries long before Joe Gibbs racing. Right. Yeah. And so, Hey man, we need a mechanic. Can you come up here? So I guess he gets Stanley on the phone. I talked to Stanley and I think he said, I'll pay $700 a week to come up here and go to work. And I'm like, all right. So the wife wasn't real big on it, but we loaded up again and moved to Birmingham and <laughs> worked on worked on his car. Good night, man. And uh, I finished the season with them, and then Joe and Rick, well, however all that went on, they talked Mr. Miller into moving the deal to Joe Gibbs Racing when they started with Jimmy and Dale Jarrett. Well, I didn't think nothing of that at the time. It ended up being kind of cool in the end, but so we, they – we had a contract with them for 19 races and I think that was 91 maybe. And, uh, so they switched it to a Maritron batteries, which was like their jobber battery. And it was me, Chad Knaus, Chad came, he, I got Chad to come down. He lived on our couch for about four months till he got his feet on the ground. Then no he, kidding. Yeah. And wow. Then, and then he, um, so it's your fault. No, <laughs> he, he was trying hard on his own too. Yeah. 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 So yeah. no, no, yeah. I would, cause I would say it was my fault, but, uh, Chad's a great guy. He, no one has driven as hard as he is, right? And him, all the time he got spent around Ray, just made him a better racer. And his father and the people he came up around, he was destined to do really big things. And I, every time I see him, it's like, man, it's cool to see somebody from our old hometown. I mean, he's arguably the best crew chief there ever was in NASCAR, I would think, right? I mean, you got to almost say that he's definitely going to be a first ballot All Star. He's got or. Uh, Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. So I yeah. would think that's that says a lot. But it was me, him, Ronnie Crooks, Philippe Lopez, wow. Todd Foster, who was yeah. who was he's he's been around a long time, and we had a hell of a team. And we went and ran. We ran okay for a privateer. We used uh, Morgan McClure engines. I spent a lot of time at Morgan McClure. They we had uh, uh, Ronnie Grayson hung our bodies, and then we'd take them up to their shop and finish them. And Tony Glover was a big influence on all of us, you know, at the time. And um, towards the end of that season, my wife and me were starting to have some trouble. I was gone all the time. Yeah. So she packed up the kids, went back to Rockford, and I ended up having to go back up there and try to get my marriage straight because I had, you know, I had kind of neglected that. Well, I got a chance to go to work 
for Alan Dillard in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I talked her into packing up and we moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. <laughs> and they had a, it was kind of funny because I grew up in the truck repair business. So they had a, he had a big um, dump truck business is how he kind of made his living. And they had a Max, Mac wiggle, we called them wiggle wagons back then. You remember the old King of the Roads that most of the Bush guys used that had a stacker trailer with two cars and then, you know, a motorhome. Everybody drove, rode in the motorhome to the races. Well, no one could drive this Maxidine 10 speed. It, they just couldn't, they went through four or five truck drivers. So I go over there and they had, they're ready to leave for Michigan. I get in it, back it out, and everybody just, you can see them all just relax and go to sleep. And so I worked there in 93. Uh, the tire war was raging. And then in 94, we went cup racing and arguably the hardest year of my life. Um, according to the timeline that you gave me, you weren't actually working for Stanley when he got hurt at Talladega. No, I was Is not. That, that, that was the following year. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, were you there that day? Yes, I was there. What do you remember about your your friend getting hurt? You know how it is when somebody gets a driver gets hurt at the racetrack. It takes a few minutes for it to kind of circulate through the garage, because, and then everyone was really worried. And Stanley was really, really good to me and my family, and I was really upset about it. We were, of course, again, no cell phones, none of that stuff, right? So you don't really know what happened, none of that. And finally, I got a hold of Scotty Smith, his stepson, and. You know, they said it was touch and go, and then he slowly got better, and we kept in touch. And he sent me this really cool. Uh, they did a story on the five of us that worked there. I don't know, it's about two thousand, and they had a picture of us, and they it was in the Birmingham Press or Birmingham, one of the bigger newspapers there, and he had it all framed and stuff. And I called him, and he uh, he never was the same guy because you know he had some TBI involved in that, and so, but. He always said the guy, there was a, there, I don't remember the guy's name, but there was a, um, a paramedic that worked there that saved his life that day inside the car. And they got him out of the car and got him to the Birmingham. I think they flew him over there, and thank God they were able to save him. But, you know, that was beginning to show that the safety of the cars and the speeds we were running and the grip we were starting to learn how to make weren't matching up. We were starting to see some some injuries and some some problems, right? Well, uh, speaking of the tire wars, <laughs> um, you you said that that was probably the worst year of your life. Was that ninety three or ninety four? Both years. Both years. Yeah, because okay. we right. we were a when I worked at Dillard's, we were a, a factory Hoosier car, and Alan said this many times. We never would have been able to do what we did without free tires. Tire bills were really high at the time, so we always ran Hoosiers, and you know there were times it was a huge advantage. And we won some races doing it, but there were times when won some bush races. Yeah, yeah, okay. and 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 there were times that it was the worst day of your life. We went to Darlington, sat on the pole in the fall of '93, and in 15 laps he's screaming for tires. We only get four sets, and it's so Newton will not allow you to stop racing. You can't park it, not and say the tires are the problem. So we're we're mounting tires as fast. We only got like six sets of wheels with us. You carried all that stuff with you, right? And we can't hardly get them mounted fast enough. We're starting them on, I think we were 63 laps down with all the penalties before it was over with. So, it, you know, you're talking about some long days. And then blowing tires, big wrecks, crashes, cars getting tore up. And, you know, there's seven or eight of us working there. We got maybe five or six chassis, and the next race is coming. So you got to get something together to go race. And, I was really proud of our group because we, um, Freddie Fryer was our crew chief, great guy. But he's from Beaumont too, so you know, we worked. I can't even imagine how many hours we worked to stay in there, and we ended up second in the points. And I really think we'd have won the championship that year, but Steve Grissom was on good years, and he just kind of rode around. I think he won one race that year, maybe two. And they were just a little more durable. And the races where we had trouble was enough points lost that we ended up second in the points. And then a really funny story, I drove the hauler still a little bit. And they were going to get a full-time hauler driver for 94 for the cup deal. We were going to run for Rookie of the Year. And Hardy's was going to sponsor us. And we had good budget. Everything was good. We did everything we could. We had some people. So I had to go down and do the tire test. And we didn't have a Speedway car ready yet. So we took a downforce car down there. and 
Freddie had left to go do a truck deal, and I think Tom Fox had become our crew chief. So we get down there, and Newton's down there, and it's just me and another guy and, and Tom and Ward. We pull this downforce car out, and he goes, what do, you, what do you want to do? He goes, we just need to run pole speed, and, you know, we'll test at that. So Tom's like, well, just put a bigger plate on it. And I'm like, well, what plate you want to put on it? Because it's a downforce car. It's not going to run. So he throws me like an inch and a quarter. I put it all together, get warmed up, get ready, get scaled. Ward gets in it and goes out. <laughs> He's, he goes by once, goes by twice. Here comes the track people. Stop, stop, stop. We're running like 212 mile an hour laps. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, whoa, whoa. And Ward's like, well, you know how Ward is. He's just laid back. He's like, well, it drives pretty good, you know, because it's down. <laughs> so we back the plate off and get it down. But I thought it was kind of funny. They were flipping out that we ran that fast. So that's probably the fastest laps I was ever involved with in NASCAR. And it, nobody even knew about it. It just happened at a tire test. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst Warburton Im- imitation I've ever. I'm heard. sorry. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> He's a great guy, though. Yeah. He, he was he was a, he was a damn good race car driver. He could he had a great feel, and uh, I think the Hoosier War Tire War. This is my opinion. Shortened his career a little bit because he had some really big impacts in '94 because of blown tires, really big, and I don't think everybody understood what that was doing to the guys yet, you know. Tell me a good Ward Burton story about what it was like to work with him. (laughs) He brought his family a lot and his kids, and he was always real family-oriented. And him and Freddie, he, when we were bush racing, him and Freddie would get to arguing on the radio. And a lot of times it was about stagger because we were still kind of running bias tires a lot on the Grand National cars. And he'd get to yelling and hollering in that, country accent and you couldn't understand what the faster he tried to talk the worse it got <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah finally freddie come on the radio goes ward i do not understand what you're trying to say we're going to open a stagger up and you're going to drive it and he didn't say a word the rest of the race <laughs> <laughs> but he he was he was always pretty calm you know great to the team yeah. you know he'd show up with burgers he'd take everybody out to dinner he just one of them guys you know he, he's a guy you like to work for you went to work with Mark Martin and Roush Racing in 1995, and that was obviously a step up the the competition ladder. Yeah. Uh, did you feel any kind of additional pressure to perform, or was it just part of a natural career progression for you? Well, it was uh, – I think what had happened was Steve was still changing fronts. Steve Mill was still changing fronts. And we'd pitted around them a few times at the end of the 94 season, and I'd gotten pretty good changing tires. I'd really worked at it because I was doing Grand National races. Philippe would let me do Grand National races on Saturday. So I'd done a lot. I'd gotten to be pretty experienced. And I I really think that's probably why they offered me the job to start with because he was wanting to get off the box. And there's a really funny story about this. So we went to Atlanta with the cup car the last race of the year and I'd had the job we went down and tested and that's when they hired me so I was finishing out the season at Dillard's and I was going to start December 1st at Roush and they were in Liberty at the same at that time and we were cooking along there and I had hurt my thumb with a we were at a fishing deal and I cut my thumb and the guy thought it was okay and well I get through about the fourth stop and I got stitches but I'm okay I'm changing and my tendon broke in my thumb and went up in my arm. And I, so I tape my shit to the gun. And You're in a stop. <laughs> yeah. So I get through that stop, and then I tape my hand to the gun to finish. I think we had three more stops, got through the day. And then I drove the hauler home, too. So I go you to ta- the, You taped your hand. Yeah, <laughs> to the gun with duct tape, my left hand, because I couldn't squeeze with my, you know, I, it's the tendon that pulls your yeah, thumb yeah. down, you know. And I, I couldn't wow. do that. So <laughs> Wow. <laughs> finished the stops, got... Got the hauler loaded, drove the hauler home. That was the last time I probably drove the hauler. Me and another guy were sharing it. And uh, and this was at Roush with Mark. No, this is at the last race I worked at Ward Burton's in '93. Okay. But gotcha. I'd been hired to be a tire changer at Roush Racing. You okay. know, and Steve yeah. Meal. This is yeah. big. Yeah. My break, right? This is going to be it. So I go to the doctor on Monday, and he's like, "We're going to have to do surgery." So they go in, and there's I got this big scar here, and they they fix it, and everything's good. And I'm in this like hand formed cast thing, right? So I show up December 1st at Roush, got my toolbox, all my stuff. We'd moved to Asheboro, found a nice apartment. My wife actually got a job managing an apartment complex. So things are starting to be better for us financially, and this is good for us. We've got two small boys, you know. And uh, 
Steve's like, what's up, man? I'm like, <laughs> I said, I'll be good. I'm ready to go. This comes yeah. off in another week, and I'll, I'll be good to go. And so there was a lot of pressure to perform on that car. You know, you were expected to win. And, you know, uh, I served as, like, the front-end mechanic. I did the fuel cells. Uh, I liked plumbing cars, and Steve was a – Steve's kind of OCD with building cars. That's kind of his thing. He's probably a fabricator first before anything else. And so I would plumb all the cars because we used to hand make all the lines, you know, and we didn't have all these companies that just you bought kits from, you know, you don't do that back then. And uh, so we go to Daytona and, you know, you're up in the front garage now. It's a different environment. You know I mean? Seniors parked right there. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a big deal to me. And you're, you're starting to be around guys that you looked up to for years, you know. And Steve was really good to me as far as helping me understand what it was like to be a professional race car mechanic. I don't think I really understood that until I went to work at Roush. And Jack was frankly a hard ass you know what i mean he expected results and and i get it there's a lot of money getting spent and mark was super nice to everybody but he expected results too you know he wanted to run run up front and win the championship and i think we won four races the first year and we won a ton of bush races i changed on the winn dixie car i it was a lot i think in two or three years we won 21 22 races something like that so for me it was a very hectic time because I was working on a cup car, so we would typically, the bush race was right before happy hour, the cup cars would run their last practice right after the bush race. So we'd get busting our butt to get the car ready, and then most of the guys wanted to kind of watch the race or at least be about, well, I had to go change, run up to pit road, and I'd usually, they'd be taking the green when I'm plugging in, getting ready. and. Um, Bobby Leslie was the crew chief on that car, but Steve called the races. So Steve always went up and he talked to Mark on the radio and did the strategy and all that stuff. So we'd do that, bust our butt, win most of the time. I mean, a lot, a lot more than not. And then it was kind of a cool thing back then. A lot of times when Mark would want run, all the cars would pull out on pit road i know you remember this and they would be ready for happy hour yeah, right and yeah. most of the fans would stay and watch happy hour you know it was kind of a two for one deal Wrong. back then it yeah. was great there were times when mark would win and everybody would wait for mark to get his pictures made get in the car and our truck driver would drive the car up because he went out by points right that's how you went out and we were always in the top three or four points and they would wait and let mark get in and then we'd go and i don't think they do that nowadays yeah. but back then there was like a there was more of a camaraderie between the teams. There, we were we were putting on a show and we were racing against each other, but you were more apt to help somebody than not. And I don't think that's the case anymore. From my last few years in the in the in the series and in NASCAR, it was it's gotten to be a pretty pretty cutthroat deal. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. and I get it. There's a yeah. lot of money involved now, right? So, but that was always cool to you know. Then you pop your gun at the white flag. I never went to Victory Lane. I don't think I have one Victory Lane picture with that car, and, and I changed tires on a lot of them, and then run back, change back into my Valvoline uniform and work happy hour. And this is back when we're, you know, we're changing engines two or three times. The the qualifying setups were just crazy. We were taking stuff out of the car, putting lead in the frame rails, running two or three ga you know gallons of fuel, and so you had all this workload, plus having to go up and work the races. So. I don't know if the, your original question about the pressure, yeah, you felt it, but you're just so damn busy <laughs> yeah, to yeah. just go and yeah. do it, right? Tell me about Mark Martin, the competitor. How how intense was he? Fierce. I mean fierce. He I, I think Mark hated to lose more than he did loved winning. Yeah. And he hated to run bad. Like – he wasn't that bad if we ran in the top three or four and we were competitive all day. You know, he wasn't happy, but he, he wasn't miserable either. But we go run ninth, 10th, 12th, and just to us, be struggle all day, that was not going to be good. You know what I mean? And so the Tuesday morning meetings when Jack would show up were always, always aggressive. And you didn't want to be that guy, right? You didn't want to be that guy that had a bad stop. You know, yeah. you just didn't want to be that guy. Trust me. <laughs> you were going to get some one-on-one -on -one attention in a team meeting, right? <laughs> so you didn't want that. From the sound of it, uh, Mark was also a little bit of a peacemaker. 
at one point between you and Jeff Burton. Yeah. I, I got to hear that story. This, me and Jeff are friends now, but there was a time when they first started the 99 car, Jack had a different way of motivating us, and he he pitted us against each other now that I look back, right? So it was, you know, Liberty against Mooresville, basically, right? Frankie was the car chief on that car, and uh, I didn't care for him. He was a very tough, aggressive yeah. New Englander. I respect him a lot for what he's done, but we never never saw eye to eye. Buddy Parrott was a good guy, but he was always the backslapper, you know, and, and, and Frankie was the driver of the, how it went, right? So we raced each other really hard, probably harder than we ever should have. And we're at Charlotte one night. There's a lot of animosity between the teams. Well, for some reason, Buddy picks right in front of us on pay road. And you don't do that. You don't pit next to your teammate. That's like an yeah. unwritten rule, right? right. You just don't, you're just asking for trouble at this time in racing, right? So we're running better than him. We qualified better than him. I don't know. We're running probably top five. They're running seventh, eighth. And so when you jump off the wall, I was changing fronts. When you jump off the wall and you – you start I start looking for my first mark, which is the hub cap. I can see Jeff coming, right? And it's a night race. This is a six hundred and he's got a clear visor on. He's looking right at me. I'm he can say he wasn't, but I know for a fact he was. Because you know when somebody when you make an eye contact, right? So he's brushing me back and what he's doing is he's turning into a stall early and he's forcing me to kind of stand up and not get down like I want to where I want to be off the tire in a good position. So this is really hurting our pit stops because I can't do anything. And Steve's – Mark's bitching because he's losing spots, and Steve's grabbing me, you know, by the shirt. You know, what's wrong? What? And I start explaining to him. And he's mad, and I'm mad. Everybody's mad at this point, right, because he's kind of screwing up our race. Well, it's about the fourth or fifth stop, and we had – we'd probably gotten up to second or third. We had a really good car that night, and he was probably dropped a couple spots. And I had gotten down. I was hitting – I hit about the third or fourth lug nut coming off, and he runs over my right heel and foot with the left front tire, the pipes, valence, left rear tire, and, man, it it hurt. It messed my foot up. So I stumble around, finish the stop, and, of course, they cart me off and take me down to that little hospital down there in Concord at the time and x-ray it. Nothing's broke, thank God. It it just barely pulled a little bit of my Achilles tendon off my heel, just a, like it – a fracture they call it a micro tear so i'm still in my fire suit right i'm on crutches i come back my wife's at the race it's charlotte right so the whole families are there and charlotte was a big deal to us because that's when all of it you know you're racing in oh, front yeah. of everybody yeah. right charlotte was kind of the, the race right so we get uh i get back and i'm on crutches and it's a rain delay it started raining so I'm going up to the trailer to change and go home, right? My wife says she can take me on home. So I'm going up in the trailer. Well, Mark and Jeff are standing at the very front where our shock station was right before you went up to the lounge. And they're up there just laughing and having a good old time. And that just hit me wrong. And I crutch is down and I go after him, right? And I'm going to beat his ass. I'm mad at this point. And I'm just red, right? Completely dumb. I should have never done it, but I did. So I get a shot or two in, Jeff does, we're scuffling and the whole deal, and Mark breaks <laughs> wow. us up. Well, Jack's up in the lounge. Hello. So he pops down, and this is not good. Wow. Right? So he makes Jeff leave, and he takes me up in the lounge, and I explain to him the whole deal, and I figure I'm fry. I'm going to get fired yeah. on Tuesday. Yeah. I figure I'm done, right? But I, I'd lost my cool. What are you going to do? I probably lost my cool four or five times in my career, and it was not good. Probably kept me from ever being a cup crew chief. It is what it is. So we get there on Tuesday, and they pull me in the office, and they're like, look, we understand what happened. Can't happen again. And that was it. I was shocked. And I still believe to this day the only reason that was is because I was pretty good changing tires, and it, it was kind of hard to replace that in the middle of the season. <laughs> so, <laughs> but me and Jeff made All peace, right, and we yeah. had – Jack made us the next race. We got together and talked about it. And Je I don't think Jeff would ever admit to this day that he – I don't think he did it on purpose, but I think he was trying to get as close as he could. And a lot of people might say, oh, that's bullshit. Them drivers wouldn't ever try that. And I'm like, yeah, they would. It happens all the time. Really? Yeah. I'll tell you another story about Ernie Irvin. So Ernie and Mark were 
really good friends. Yeah. Like too good of friends to be racing each other all the time. So of course they were going to race each other harder than they ever raced anybody. Same deal. They're pitted in front of us. They, Ernie keeps brushing us back, brushing us back. And Steve Spar, who's one of the greatest jackmen that ever lived, he actually passed away not too long ago with a heart attack, which is a shame. He's a great guy. He was jacking and he knows what's going on. He can see it, the whole deal. He's like, I got it. Don't jump early. I'm like, really? He goes, I got it. Don't do anything. So he comes off the wall and he's got the jack in his hand and Ernie's coming by and he just cleans the spoiler off of it with his jack like he accidentally hit it, right? And it just, well, we didn't have to deal with Ernie the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Spar was a cool, and he did it so oh, nonchalant. Wow. He just did it no, not so nonchalant that it was like, this is cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, we were running two-piece spoilers at the time, you know, and they were like welded in and the, yeah. the old full body template went in between them so when he hit it it just took that template that blade and just knocked it down and you take that much blade out of a car it it's going to change the way it drives and it's not going to get better you know so I mean? ernie's pe- ernie's crew didn't see him? i don't think they ever said much so they about never it fixed no it. they they tried beating it up and stuff okay. but it was right. it, it was detrimental for a while you know i mean you can't Go. you know how the racing was in you yeah you have a couple bad you know segments of the race and you were out you were done you know you weren't gonna have a chance to win (laughs) (laughs) you you talked about going over the wall as a tire changer and you've talked about some of your close calls and everything what was your most embarrassing moment on pit road probably mark hit me and i went over the roof on national tv and my whole family was down in florida my brother lived down there he was a deputy sheriff yeah so my brother was at the race, my niece was at the race, and everybody was at home watching it. And it had started to sprinkle. And so Mark comes in, and Ricky Rudd was pitting in front of us in the Tide car. I remember that. And I don't know why I jumped, because he looked hot anyway, but you know how it is. It's kind of, a, when you change tires, it's kind of a muscle memory thing, right? You, there's about 20 steps you go through and thought process you go through. and. So I jump and I realize, man, he, I'm not going to make it. So I jumped, landed in the V on the valve lane, and then over the roof. Well, we had a roof camera. So Benny Parsons, who's the greatest guy ever, he sees it somehow on his thing. So they, after they come out of commercial, they replay it and show it. And my wife and everybody, well, it was kind of embarrassing that that happened, right? I mean, you get hit on pit road. That was that was kind of dumb. I should have never jumped. I should have just let him slide through, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was pretty embarrassed about that. How did you wind up over at Joe Gibbs? So at the this is a another this is a contentious Roush story, and I don't know how much this story has been told in the past, but. At the end of the 96 season, we hadn't won a race. We didn't win a race all of 96. This was very bad, right? We had good cars, fast cars. We were kind of trying to develop our new chassis, our in-house chassis, and we just couldn't get over the hump. There was a couple times. So they brought Jimmy Finnegan in 97 to be our crew chief and moved Steve up to general manager of the two-car team. I thought it was a great move because Steve was awesome at running the fab shop and doing all that stuff. And Jimmy might be one of the best chassis guys I've ever been around. And he and so you gotta realize technology's starting to come into the sport at this point. We used to have racks of Bilstein shocks that you didn't take apart and they were all these different numbers for rebound and compression, right? And we had these magic shocks for Bristol and magic shocks for Dover and you didn't touch those springs and shocks. They sat in the corner, right? That's kinda how it was. A little bit of voodoo, which it really wasn't, but it was at the time. So Jimmy changed that about us. We started running Penske rebuildable shocks, and he was building, he was machining his own pistons and doing a lot of crazy stuff. And we had a great year. Almost, if, if we wouldn't, have, I think we broke four timing chains that year. I think we would have won championship easily if we wouldn't have broke those four timing chains. So at the end of the year, Jack has this big meeting with the whole team, brings us all in. He says, "Hey, we're moving the six car to Mooresville, and Johnny's coming to drive, and it's going to be 26, and you guys ain't going." And I'm like, "Well, that kind of sucks, but." didn't lose my job and i got kids so that's what matters so the meeting breaks up and jimmy comes and gets me and goes hey we want to talk to you down in the conference room so they bring me down to conference room it's mark jimmy and jack They're like hey we want you to come to mooresville but you can't tell anybody until after the season well this hits me the wrong way this is this is the team that steve's the guy that brought me in and i have giant respect for him right he taught me everything personally 
for financial stuff. My brother and father got killed while I worked there, and my father in an accident, and my or my brother in an accident. My father in a he was working on a vehicle and it fell on him. And Steve, I wouldn't have made it through that time without him. So this hit me wrong. So I ended up quitting. I'm like, I ain't doing it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sticking in a fork in these guys. It ain't right. And so I didn't do it. So they were offering you a chance to, to go get... be a car chief on Mark's car in '98. Okay. So I I didn't do it. Hindsight, again, I'll probably let my emotions get to me, but it's just the, that's who I am, right? So Gary Bechtel was had a cup team, and Jeff Green was driving for him. And I had a really good relationship with the Saddlers, Elliot Sadler and Hermie. I, I changed tires a lot of Grand National races for him on off weekends when we weren't running the – or at, tr- at the track when we weren't running the 60 made a lot of side money and they were really good to me so elliot says hey won't you come be my crew chief i'm going to run five races for bechtel and keep my rookie deal so i moved over there and i was not ready to be a crew chief at all and i did a horrible job of it and so i realized this and we went to richmond in the spring and i was changing tires on the trop arctic car that he drove for sandy jones remember that in the yeah. bush series oh, yeah. yeah and uh he I realized riding up there, I'm like, this ain't gonna work. I'm I'm failing miserably, right? It's not working out. We're not running good. It's we're struggling. He's wrecked a couple cars. You know, we've had some problems. I don't care for Gary now that I've gone to work for him. He's a very wealthy, arrogant man, right? And doesn't know nothing about racing really. Now is this '98? Yeah, this is the beginning of 98. 98, okay. So it's early in the season. First, whatever spring Richmond was. So I go up, and I start walking through the cup garage, and I'm like, well, I'm going to look for a job. And lo and behold, I walk up on Maycar first. Well, at this time, this is starting to, the science is starting to come into racing, right? And the engineering is starting to, to, to play into it. So they everybody's running these elaborate qualifying setups. They're taking lots of parts out of the car, takes a lot of time to switch it back and forth right so jimmy decides he's going to add a guy on the road and this becomes like the the modern day front end mechanic that you see on you saw on a lot of the teams so i take the job and they're still in the old shop it's just bobby and so i think maybe we went to michigan was the first race i went to with them and we had a pretty good season that year and uh i worked really hard i loved working there you have to be around Joe to understand what kind of human he is. It, him and JD, they're there's just no one better. They're they're. I never worked for Mr. H. They say he's like that too, but Joe was a huge influence on my life, and JD was too. So we over that winter we were going to move into the new shop, and Tony was going to come on as a uh, our teammate, right in '99. So. John Wolf was our car chief on the on the car, and he was kind of promised the crew chief job. And I don't know what all happened behind closed doors. I wasn't involved in any of that, but ended up he didn't get it, and they hired Greg Zipadelli, which in hindsight was a great call because Greg is one of the best crew chiefs I've ever been around. He's awesome, great guy, super smart. Probably still with Tony. Yeah, and yeah. And, and, yeah. and and I would give Greg a, a lot of credit for changing the sport towards the engineering side of what went on right so john quit he was mad and he got the job as ted musgrave's crew chief at butch mock at the time i think so i got made car chief start the 99 season and this is the greatest thing ever right i got i'm kind of back where i really wanted to be on one of the best teams in the garage we got a brand new at the time was probably the taj mahal shop of the whole series had sponsored plenty of sponsorship. I think we had MBNA and interstate batteries on the car. Tony was coming at, there's a funny story about that. I'll tell you this one real quick. So they had this like seven test rule going on at the time. They, the testing rules were starting to get put in place cause they were killing the teams with all the testing. So me, Mark Cronquist, Jason line, Luke Shimp and Maycar took, Tony's car, his Daytona 500 car for nine hunt for 99 down to Talladega in the late fall to get it broke in, and we acted like it was kind of our car, and you know used one of our tests, the whole deal. So Tony shows up down there, and this is the first time I'd really been around him a lot, and and 
So <laughs> it starts raining. And so we're gonna we're running. Of course, you're gonna get the rental cars out, right? We're making laps around there. So <laughs> I don't know. Tony's one of the greatest guys there ever was to be around. He he really can't sit still. He likes Tony, to Stuart. Stuart. Yeah, he likes to be doing stuff all the time, right? So he gets this deal together. He's like, Let's all make a lap. We'll time it, and the slowest guy has to buy dinner. And we're like, okay. So we all go out, and, every, and these things it, in I the think, rain. No, it it stopped, and okay, we're trying okay. drying a track, you know. So. And the car was really fast right off the trailer. So there wasn't a lot of urgency here, right? So <laughs> we all get there's I think they're Chrysler Intrepids. Remember those? Yeah. And they got like a 105-mile-an-hour limiter on them. So we're all smooth as we can be out to the wall, all the way to the bottom, trying not to put any wheel in it, stay just under the limiter. And we're all pretty close. Tony gets in it, runs it wide open around the apron, and beats us by like four seconds. And he thinks that is the funniest thing ever. <laughs> Beat you on the apron. <laughs> yeah. okay. <All> wide open. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you one more funny story about him. I, I don't want to not tell this one because it's really, really funny. So when I, the last year I changed tires competitively, they put together kind of a put together crew to change on the remember when tony drove the shell oil car for bobby right in the bush series this would be 98 i guess right yeah yeah so joe came around and made it pretty sweet to us he said look i got it we'll rent a jet you which is kind of big at the time to have not a king air but have a jet and we'll take you guys on race day and come back and do the deal right so we go down to miami and it's hot as shit down here i mean we get off the plane i'm like damn it's hot you know how it can be down there right yeah <clears throat> Excuse me. So he, uh, I can't remember the guy's name is Crew Chief, but they got a really good car, and he is kicking their asses. But right off the bat, he starts complaining about being hot in the car. And Tony was a little bit of a partier back then. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to say much more than that, but I think that his reputation precedes him a little bit, right? So he he's really starting to complain. We go through one stop, maybe two. And finally, he's like, he wants to quit, and Joe's on him about staying out there. And then finally, they're like, well, if you can't do it, just pull it in. So the next corner, he comes in, pulls in the garage. We're leading the race. So we unplug. And and I don't know if you know Jeff Chandler or not, but he's, a I don't know, a 30-year employee at Gibbs and one of the most veteran guys around, great tire changer in his day, and was a great guy. So we go up into the trailer to change, and we're going to go get on a plane and go home. We, we don't – our deal, we didn't have to clean up nothing or nothing. It was a sweet gig, right? So Tony's laying in the trailer in his tidy white. He's just red as a beet. And he's obviously got heat stroke, right? It, and yeah. he didn't get, he wasn't prepared to run in this. You know how it is. You got to get hydrated and all that. And I won't say the girl's name, but his girlfriend at the time, she's over him with a wet rag and she's dialing on him, right? And he's right in the middle of the aisle. And you know how thin the aisles are. Chandler steps over him and he gets about halfway over him and he goes, Nice job, rookie. <laughs> we all go up to the <laughs> walk back out. <laughs> How did that go over? He didn't say nothing. Oh, wow. Because he was, what could he say? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. And Chandler, he's not going to pull any punches, right? Yeah. He's, he's a veteran, been around a long, long time, and we just had a chance to win here. And you, nice you know, job, you, winning's pretty hard in this sport. I don't care what class you're in, trucks, Grand National cars, cup cars, it's hard to get to victory lane. You know, you think about it. He win three or four races a year. That's a pretty big deal, you know. And he had never won in a Bush car. He ended up never. He actually, I actually ended up winning the first Bush race with him at Harvick's that he ever won. And so <laughs> it's just funny the way he he was. But he he come on to be one of the greatest drivers ever in the sport, right? So. <laughs>